April 1994. A little organization called the Interactive Digital Software Association sees the light of day. Originally made up of Sony, EA, Nintendo, Capcom and a few others, it would go on to grow significantly in size. Today, over 33 gaming companies are part of the association you may know by the name Entertainment Software Association or the organizers behind E3, whatever you prefer. The same guys that leaked private information of attendees multiple times or claim to have their coolest office in DC. For how long they will be able to keep it with these expenditures for lobbying is questionable though. The ESA itself says that its policies are guided by businesses serving on three working groups, Intellectual Property Working Group, Public Policy Committee and Public Relations Working Group. Fancy words for yes Nintendo is here and controlling the public discussion around all that's written here. Let's see how a coalition of gaming giants justifies some of their questionable views. Starting off with Right to Repair. Console protections are undercut by so-called right to repair legislation. These types of mandates could significantly compromise the security of video game consoles and the security of the video game ecosystem they rely on. In addition, allowing unauthorized parties to bypass the console's technical protections, which may be necessary for certain hardware repairs, would allow any number of illegally copied games to be played. Piracy doesn't even put a dent in these companies which is why they will never tell you how much they lost to it. After all, it's peanuts. Look at Valve, they made the Steam Deck with Right to Repair in mind. Partnered with iFixit to sell replacement parts. Is nobody buying games from Steam anymore because of this? No, Valve is doing completely fine. Even Microsoft's PR team is at least considering it. Security of consoles get breached already, even without right to repair. No wonder when a paperclip is enough to do so. What most regulations aim to achieve is that you don't need to buy an entire controller when the stick drifts. So it's quite funny hearing the ESA putting this on the same level as spilling all the beans about console protection. They simply don't want you to repair consoles. Instead, how about buying a new one? Or let them repair it for you? So you don't hurt yourself, stupid little consumer. They want to protect the monopoly on repair, that's it. And not the good type of monopoly. The video game industry supports free expression and opposes any attempt to restrict video game publishers, developers, artists, storytellers and players. Sounds like the same industry that makes million dollar offerings to get people to stay silent, where whistleblowers rather talk to Jason Schreier than to the public out of fear to get blacklisted and never be hired by the industry again. Notice how they name themselves first and players last. Funny coincidence. The video game industry believes in empowering consumers through enhanced consumer choice by taking away all your rights to ownership. Oh, oh, oh wait, sorry, wrong one. The video game industry believes in empowering consumers through enhanced consumer choice. Allowing regulatory flexibility for such offerings will only serve to enhance consumer choice. Microsoft. Ghostwriting is our passion. Okay, what else is there? Immigration is cool as long as we get skilled workers out of it. Positive studies about games are prominently featured on their own website. Negative ones get criticized as you'd expect. Like this one about loot boxes or gaming addiction. Privacy is important to us. Here's a label we control ourselves. More on that in a bit. Because this statement has priority. The ESA is an equal employment opportunity employer and does not discriminate in any of its employment actions based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin, ancestry, marital status, veteran status, age, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, gamers. Okay, please all act shocked when I tell you that this organization, which had to point out twice in the same sentence that they're not racist, an organization with Activision on its board had its own Bobby Kotick for a time named Galga. Several employees described Galga as a boss who was very difficult to work with, saying he was seen as manipulative, moody and sometimes nasty. He told at least one person in the games industry that he liked to pit his employees against one another to elicit the best work from them. One thing he said was that if you had not burned people out in three years, you probably haven't been working them hard enough. He was, one source told Variety, a big fan of Trump's. 
stocking his office with Trump wine and proudly displaying a copy of Trump's box game in his office. Yes, it actually exists. Interestingly, over the summer of 2018, Altman, ESA Vice Chair, and Phil Spencer, Head of Xbox, both traveled to Washington DC. They spent two days meeting with a number of employees at the association in a conference room, asking them about, among other things, Gallagher's management and behavior and whether it was negatively impacting the ESA and its goals. After the meeting, the two left and those at the ESA didn't hear a word for months. All of this came to light under the condition of anonymity and it seems not without reason. Over the course of Variety's investigation, staff at the ESA checked phone records of employees and fired one seemingly without cause, later offering a settlement in exchange for his silence. Deja vu, I guess. Modern video games offer a wealth of new content post-launch and live services to connect players across the world. Even so, the purchase price of most games has remained relatively static over the past decade. In-game purchases make additional content and ongoing live services possible in a way that provides consumers the option to pay for what they want and skip what they don't want. A very positive way of saying, full price games are being released with insufficient content DLC gets announced even before the actual game gets released, everything possibly imaginable gets locked behind a paywall. I mean, this is getting ridiculous. I hate trains anyway. What the fuck? Yeah, it, it's still 6 million. All while keeping the initial purchase price of games moderate, $70 moderate to be exact, or in some cases free, at the cost of people who get addicted. Whales, as the industry lovely calls them, people who spend thousands on loot boxes to the industry, nothing more than walking wallets. At the same time, the video game industry ensures that consumers, and especially parents, are aware of the availability of in-game purchases and offers tools to limit or prevent monetary transaction through the Entertainment Software Ratings Board ESRB. Guess who founded the ESRB? Yup, the video game industry is supposed to regulate itself with ratings. Self-regulatory means that this is E for everyone. ESRB would now say it's not gambling and to prove it we made an extra label for that totally not dangerous thing that warrants an extra label because it's not dangerous, that parents will obviously overlook or not understand. The ESRB has always been governed by the same board of directors as the ESA, which is made up of senior executives from leading game publishers who elect its chair, like Take 2 CEO Strauss Zelnick for a few years. Same goes for Peggy, also founded by a lobby organization called the Interactive Software Federation of Europe. Okay you two, I give you a chance to defend yourself. Against how about this? Who wants to start? Wow, Peggy, let's hear it! The trailer includes imagery that is generally known from casinos, Wheel of Fortune, slot machines. Yes! Using this sort of mechanic to select an item or character or action by chance is not the same as teaching how to gamble for money in a casino. No, you are this close. But we are very aware that it may get too close for comfort for some people and that is part of an internal discussion that Peggy is having for the moment. The internal discussion concluded that everything should stay the same apparently. Next one. ESRB does not consider loot boxes to be gambling. While there is an element of chance in these mechanics, the player is always guaranteed to receive in-game content even if the player unfortunately receives something they don't want. We think of it as a similar principle to collect card games. Sometimes you'll open a pack and get a brand new holographic card, but other times you'll end up with a pack of cards you already have. Rating sports are obviously brain dead or deeply controlled by the industry. You can sell cards, they have real value unlike digital assets. They also don't look like they're straight out of a casino and can't manipulate you with 10 different currencies or constant pop-ups of limited offerings. Parents are also far more likely to limit the amount of money children can spend on cards than on gambling mechanics that are marketed under E for everyone can be a gambler. These two organizations believe this is not gambling not even simulated gambling. 